Hey there. Sorry for the less than beautiful surroundings and my almost prison-like brick wall. That's where I am today. Anyway, okay, what's the latest on Tommy Robinson? Yesterday, the uh, court case was unsealed in the UK so people can report on it in the UK and we started to get some proper details of what happened in the actual courtroom after Tommy was lifted off the streets one and a quarter hours after he started live streaming and put quickly in front of a judge with incoherent and probably contradictory maybe even deliberately wrong information given to his team so that he was not represented by a competent lawyer who knew his history and his case and especially the vital case from Canterbury the year before one year before where Tommy was found guilty of breaking a specific 1925 law against photography uh, and uh, is he into photography a hey, hey, nudge nudge wink wink and that specific case where he was found guilty he didn't put up a great defense at that case he basically just said I'm really sorry I broke some rules I shouldn't have done that and I won't do it again and uh, his lawyers kind of accepted this judgment that was handed down on him which included a three-month suspended sentence from that judge in Canterbury a suspended sentence what does that mean it means that for a period and it was for 18 months for a period of 18 months if he got into trouble in almost any way um, the three-month sentence would just kick in and he'd go to prison no matter what else he'd got into trouble for. Uh, it's not, um, it's a bit more complicated, but that's that's the essence of it. Nobody ever fought that. He never appealed that. Uh, he just had it hanging over his head. Now, the judge in the Leeds case, the current case, the case that actually got him sent to prison in a heartbeat, that judge said in the court, apparently, uh, it's being reported, that he didn't watch the whole live stream. He just caught a couple of seconds of it. Now, I watched the whole live stream, so I'm ahead of the judge on this. So the judge didn't watch the primary evidence that he's using to say Tommy broke the rules of his court and the law. Now, I was watching that live stream almost from the start, almost at the end. I think I skipped out a couple of times when I got a phone call. That's what I missed. But all throughout that live stream, Tommy was unbelievably careful to refer to the defendants as alleged, as on trial, as the case continues. These are all very key words that when you're reporting on an active trial in the UK, you must do. You must never assume the guilt or innocence of the defendants. You must always put forward that they are actually innocent until proven guilty. You must always say that they have alleged. You must point out if they pled not guilty, um, you, you have to do all of that. And he did it. As far as I could rem tell from reviewing that live stream, he was right on it. And I'm going to just read the paragraph that this is the, this is the bit from Canterbury from one year earlier from his suspended sentence. In short, Mr. Yaxley Lennon, turn up at another court, refer to people as, and it's in quotes, Muslim paedophiles, Muslim rapists, end quotes, and so on and so forth while trials are ongoing and before there has been a finding by a jury that that is what they are and you will find yourself inside do you understand so the judge there specifically said don't call them muslim pedophiles don't call them muslim rapists and so on and so forth so you know in legal terms one starts to then argue what does and so on and so forth but Tommy definitely, in his mindset, and it's clear from his shock at being arrested, felt that he was complying with the letter of that earlier ruling. Now, is there another secret or semi-secret or under-reported restrictions on this case? Well, there probably are. And Tommy knew about some of those, it would appear, because he knew that this was a multi-part case and that there were restrictions ongoing and it seems that this is probably what he fell foul of but nevertheless as i contended in my sort of more um in, in the videos i did outside the british embassy here in tel aviv by the way i'm brian of london i'm in tel aviv but i'm commenting because you know 
I can. <laughs> this is the internet. Sorry, Theresa May. What, the, the, if Tommy knew that there were additional reporting restrictions, because this is a massive trial that's been split into three parts. Parts one and two are pretty much over. It seems that the juries have finished their work, but there's still a part three to come. Okay, and this is a very, very key point of what's going to happen in the UK. This is, this is something that Tommy is exposing that's going to be a huge problem for the British authorities going forward, which is that we've now had, I don't know how many of these trials, I, I, could, I could look, it's all on um, Peter McLaughlin's website that accompanies his book Easy Me. He's got a tabulation of pretty much every single one of the trials in these types of cases. And this is a very specific case. I know the Americans get upset with the word grooming. And it does seem like a euphemistic term for what's going on here, which is child rape, okay? Child rape and prostitution and the selling of children to men, okay? For sex and worse, it, including right all the way up to murder because there are cases where the girls have gone, disappeared. Grooming seems like a, a bad word, but I, I just want to explain the crime a little bit, okay? And then I'll come back to why Tommy was doing what he's doing and why the whole court system of the UK is probably going to run into a massive problem in the future. All right, that's what's coming. I'll try not to go on for 40 minutes again today. So grooming, it's called grooming because the way it works is this. One young, uh, probably attractive, uh, one or two, you know, a small group of young and attractive men start to befriend schoolgirls, 11, 12, 13, that kind of age, outside the schools. They rock up in fancy cars, BMWs, bling. They've got the best phones. They've got, they look, they look sorted, these guys. And they are. And these girls, the ones that they pick on, come from messed up homes. No, one parent, no parents, in the care of the state, in children's homes, just living hard, cruel lives in northern cities that have, often northern cities, but it actually spreads all across the country, to be honest. Um, that's who these guys go for. And they go for, they don't go for just white kids, by the way, because it's not a race crime. It's not a crime about race. They went for Sikh kids early on. They like Sikh girls, but the Sikhs formed a thing called the Sikh Awareness Society, and they started educating their children decades ago, decades before the white indigenous British got wise to this or were allowed to be wise to this. The Sikhs actually, they, they again, it's all in Easy Meat, it's all in Peter's book. You can find out about a pitch battle in a curry house between Sikhs and Muslims over their daughters. You know, the, these Muslims were attacking their daughters. The Sikhs picked up their ceremonial swords and fought a battle in a curry house. Everybody went to prison. This crime of grooming is, so they, they befriend the girls and they appear to be their boyfriends. And in fact, in Holland, they had a, uh, they, they actually made a movie about this to try and warn the girls and, and um, I, you know, lover boy was the term that, that they were using. So it, at the start, this is not grabbing a girl, taking her to a park and raping her, which is a crime that happens. And it's a crime that would generally happen along the lines of the, uh, the scale of, of, of the number of people in the, st in the state. So yeah, white men will grab white pedophiles British indigenous white people will commit crimes like that, grabbing a girl. It's unbelievably rare, but it happens. This grooming thing though, of deliberately targeting these girls, taking them outside the schools, encouraging them to believe that they're, girl, they're, they're a girlfriend, giving them food in the chicken shops, giving them, showing them some love basically, showing them some affection, showing them that they're worth something. Again, this is all in the BBC drama. It's sort of laid out. But then it turns off, it gets harder. They're given alcohol. They're given drugs. They're then said, well, look at all the things we've given you. Shh, you know, lift your top. 
and it just snowballs. It snowballs into the point where these girls are hooked on drugs, they're threatened, their family, they, their families are threatened. If you, if you tell on us, we will kill your family. We will burn down your family's home. That's what happens. That's why it's called grooming, because it's a process. Okay. So grooming is not really a euphemistic term, but people use it that. I call them jihad rape gangs, because the further step, which is all laid out in Easy Meat by Peter, is once you come to realize the background of Islam, the, the tenets of Islam, the, the way uh, Muhammad treated women, he conquered people, killed the men, took the women as slaves and, and then married them. It's there, it's all in the Quran, it's in the Hadith, it's in the, 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 the biography of their prophet. And in men, multiple of these court cases, again, always suppressed in the reporting, in multiple of the court cases, some of the girls will say, there was an Islamic element to this. You know, one of the girls was branded with an M because she was the property of this Muhammad. It, 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 his property, this is the language used in the Quran and Islamic scriptures. This, this is a common theme throughout the court cases and it is a common theme that those elements are underreported or not reported. But they're in the tr court transcripts. You can find them. Tommy, therefore, knows this stuff intimately. He's co-authored a book with Peter McLaughlin, who wrote Easy Meat. Tommy's Muhammad's Quran is co-authored with Peter. They know each other very well. I know this. And what is upsetting Tommy and everyone, actually, is that the scale of these gangs, the fact that it is nationwide, that it covers the whole of the UK, that it is not restricted, as um, Majid Nawaz would say, to Pakistani or Bangladeshi Muslims. It isn't. There's Somali gangs. There's, there's gangs from almost every element. The only common theme to this crime is Islam and the mosque. That's the theme. And it's not against white girls only. No, no, they will pick up any non-Muslim girl. It is a religious hate crime. They hate these girls. They regard them as easy meat. So Tommy goes to this trial because what's angering him is that it's a massive trial in progress, but nobody's talking about it. Now, the press may have been suppressed on this one because this trial was divided into three parts. So what they're trying to do is avoid during the first one, they don't want the jury who are yet to be picked and yet to be sworn in for the second part to know anything about the first part. And they don't want the jury for the third part to know anything about the specifics of the second and the first part. And I, I understand that because I understand the British legal system, which is unbelievably restrictive about information or about dur during ongoing trials. It's just this was a three part trial. So we're in a we're in a terrible confluence, as far as Tommy is concerned, where he sees that nobody is reporting on the national scale. The national press, they'll report once these trials are finished. But in big trials, it's absolutely normal in the UK for there to be reporting during the trial. What was said yesterday? What was said the day before? And that's totally allowed. There is a restrictive set of things you can and can't say, but you can do that. But these specific rape gang trials, of which I don't even know how many there are, because the only way to find out would be, from Israel certainly, I'd have to go and look at the local court records of all of the local courts where I think there might be trials and find these cases. Or I'd have to look at the local newspapers, because again, nobody is putting this out at a national level, and that is a big problem. So I said earlier, what, what, what's the bigger picture? What does this mean for Britain and the whole legal justice system in Britain? Well, there have been something like 320 or something men convicted so far since um, the, the last few years when this has been ongoing. That's a tiny number. And, th and by the way, from that number, something like 85% are Muslim or identifiably Muslim from their names. There are probably some English names in there who are converts, but 85 is a low estimate. 90% is a more realistic one. Um, the number goes up and down by little bits, but for 
you know, Muslims are five or six percent of the British population or something like that. Male Muslims, three <laughs> percent. And so three percent of the population is giving 85 to 90 percent of the perpetrators. That's not me saying that only. Tommy says it. But so does Majid Nawaz and his organization, Quilliam, who did the research trying to find a different answer and were pretty much shocked and horrified to say, no, no, this really is actually a, he said Pakistani Bangladeshi problem, a cultural problem. No, it's Islam, actually. That's the only common theme that works. So the problem's coming to the UK, which is that if the UK public become aware of the scale of this problem, it's 40 years, hundreds of thousands of victims, maybe a million, one MP has already voiced that it might be a million. Reading Easy Meat, it's easy to believe that there could be a million victims. Then you come down to how many men have been doing this. And Gavin Bobby, the, uh, the mosque buster lawyer, great guy, he, he's done sort of statistical work on this, which I, I can't go into now, it's too long and complicated, but it's gonna be hundreds of thousands of men that took part in this, because he makes the, he always makes this clear point, is in a relationship between a prostitute and her client, who is gonna have had more sexual partners? The prostitute or the client? These girls were not willing prostitutes. Never ever let that be said, but they were prostituted. They were taken, groomed through this process of being told they're loved, and then ham they were just abused in probably the worst way that men can imagine. And I'm back. Um, the the they were prostituted, which means they were, this relationship holds. Who had more sexual partners, the girls or the men? And the obvious answer is the girls had many more sexual partners than the men. And that, that realization, so if you start to think that there's hundreds of thousands of victims, there are a hell of a lot of perpetrators. Some of these girls were saying that they were raped 30 times in one night by 30 different men. And that's at a court case where 10, 10 men get convicted. So you do the maths. And you do the maths and you work out where those men are. Because they're not in prison. There's 300 in prison. Or 300 have been sentenced. Some are probably out already. Work out where all those men are. Are they in the councils? Are they in the police? Are they in the judiciary? Who knows? Who knows? Nobody really knows. And what... Britain is going to have to do, if, they, if, if they're going to prosecute this as a regular crime, they're going to start having to find juries who don't know this fact or are not aware of this. Because when they sit down in that jury box and 15 men, 30% of whom are actually called Muhammad and the others all have Islamic names, sit there in the, ju in the accused box in front of them, how are they going to find a jury who is unaware of the Muslim jihad rape gangs that have been going on for 40 years. How are you going to do that, judiciary? I don't understand how the legal... I don't understand... Uh, someone asks, are they all UK citizens? Very, very many of them will be. And they will have been for multi-generations. This might be the... You know, this, this crime involves fathers, sons, brothers, uncles. It's familial. They share these girls in the family. These are married men with wives, with good Muslim wives and upstanding members of the community who have been sent to prison and it was brothers and it was uncles and it was their cousin who lives in another town and the girls were taken to the other town and prostituted there. It's horrific. How is the UK justice system going to continue on with these levels of reporting restrictions and attempting to find jurors who, you know, are not prejudiced? Uh, what does prejudice mean? To me, Prejudice is when a judge says, oh, I didn't really watch his live stream. I'm just going to assume that Tommy Robinson said all of the things that his press background and the, 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 the false information I've learned about Tommy for all these years from the horrific UK press. I'm going to assume he said all of those things like Muslim pedos and scum and they're guilty and send them down. I'm going to assume that because I didn't watch the live stream. I'm just going to pick him up off the street. But I'm not going to go down there and warn him. I'm not gonna send a court uh, clerk to say, hey, there are special reporting restrictions. You can't do this today here. No, 
I'm going to leave him hanging there for one hour and 15 minutes broadcasting live, which apparently is a huge, huge threat to this monster trial that's been going on for years. His one hour, 15 minute live stream. That's a huge threat to the trial, but it's not a huge enough threat that they'll stop him earlier. So they wait the hour and a quarter. They stand there in their window looking down, smiling and giggling because this judge is the guy. He's the one. He is the hero. He's the one who got to send Tommy Robinson down to prison. And the leads, I'm not even going to mention the name of this stupid outlet that published what they hoped was Tommy's home address. Hoped, and I say hoped, because the only reason to publish Tommy's home address, you've got Tommy in prison, and you know we know what could happen there, but the only reason to publish his home address is in the hope that a jihadi or someone or a far left idiot will go to his house and hurt his wife and children. That's the only reason. So Tommy was doing something and I, if Tommy was breaking a law or, or breaking a rule, it was a rule almost specifically designed and set up to get Tommy and get him in prison and get him in prison fast. The whole way in which it was done with a gagging order, it just shows the nature of these people. They are absolutely petrified about the general public finding out. So what do they do? They, they make a little BBC drama and they put that out. And then very quickly afterwards, they make a documentary and they put that out. The drama was very, very powerful. It's cited in Darren Osborne's case, the, the lunatic who did try to kill some, and kill a Muslim, uh, which, of course, is... That's the thing we're all trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid the explosion that leads to that. Darren Osborne's trial, it was much clearer from that that he was radicalised by learning what had been going on in the Rochdale case that was shown on the BBC than by, you know, an email from Tommy, which, of course, is what the press focus on. No, the problem is they're putting out what they think is just enough information to keep Britain quiet, but not enough to get the whole picture. And when people get the whole picture, if they read Easy Meat, uh, if they just look at the scale of how many cases are ongoing, which of course is difficult to do, there's going to be a big problem. So for me, Tommy needs to be out as soon as possible. Uh, Tommy needs to be safe in prison and the massive, massive online reaction and the, the 400,000 or whatever it's up to petition in, in, you know, based in America, but covering the whole world, that just blew my mind. I'm just so pleased. And um, it's, hold on, I'm just taking the time to block anybody who comes at this with Jew, non-Jew, Zionist. Yeah, I'm a Zionist. I live in Israel. I move my kids from the UK to Israel to be safe uh, from Islam. And of course, I'm living in a country where overnight they sent 100 rockets and mortars at the towns in southern Israel. So I hope we're going to smash the crap out of Hamas this time. Um, but I still feel safer in Israel and culturally safer because I'm in a place where my culture, my Jewish culture, is I can express it. And you can't repress the expression of Jewish culture in Israel. Britain needs to learn how it should be proud of British culture and nature. And if people want to be good residents and come and live there, they need to respect that. They need to not go around the country for 40 years, dragging your daughters off the street outside their schools and then raping them mercilessly. That's not how you behave as guests in a new country. And unfortunately, a lot of what underlies Islam means that immigration, Muhammad did it actually in the first time, it's called Al-Hijra, which is immigration to found an Islamic state, Al-Hijra. When they say they're year zero, uh, this is a good, Judaism counts year zero, the start, as creation. That's when Judaism, we, we measure our calendar. It doesn't matter whether it's 5,700 something years ago or not. There's plenty of reasons to say that time has changed. But year zero for Jews is the creation of the universe. Year zero for Christians is the birth. The birth as an innocent young baby 
in a manger in Bethlehem of Jesus Christ there there uh, uh, there there Christ that's that's the start of Christianity it's the birth of a child nice event the year zero for Islam is something called Al Hijra okay and it was the movement of Muhammad from Mecca to a place that was called Yathrib was a Jewish had a lot of Jews in it town but became known as today Medina from Mecca to Medina year zero was Muhammad moving because he was basically thrown out and he went to Medina to found an Islamic state the first Islamic state and that was where he transitioned from peaceful follow me prophet into let's go hit some people and steal some stuff and become a warlord and that was where he developed his big following. And he took 10,000 men back to Mecca and took it. And that's the, that's, the, um, that's the genesis of the point where Muslims say year zero, Al-Hijra, A-H. So they, the, the Islamic religion measures its start as a political event, because that's a political event. Christianity, birth of a child, Judaism, creation of the universe, these are not political events. Moving your followers to a new city and taking it over and founding an Islamic state, political. Islam is, in this way, political. For many of the followers believe it's a religion, but in bulk, its actions, because they are so beautifully handed down to the followers, in bulk, its actions, like taking the daughters of, of the kuffar around you who you despise as your sex slaves, those actions are designed to take over. That's what it is. And um, the action of not resisting it, the action of submitting to it, is called dimitude. Dimitude. You have to look that word up. You have to understand deep in your... You have to look through the Muslim's eyes, and you have to look through the eyes of a dimmi, and you understand what it is to submit to Islam, why people submitted, why for, for millennia there were dimmi populations of Jews and Christians. You can't be dimmi non-Jew or non-Christian. Dimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I, -M -M Dimmitude, put you on the end, Dimmi, it's an Arabic word. When you understand the mindset of Dimmitude, you understand the mindset of the British establishment right now today. Theresa May, Theresa May, oh I'll get angry, Theresa May is the Home Secretary, as a Home Secretary she banned Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer, both people I know well and have known for a long time. She banned them from visiting the UK. Do you know who invited them? Ah, oh, bingo, Tommy Robinson. They were, they were set to talk at an EDL rally that was about drummer Lee Rigby, who was a British soldier, who was actually a drummer in the, the, the military band, whose head was almost cut off on the streets in London by a guy who then appears on a cell phone video, waving a machete, a bloody machete, has blood all over him. This drummer is dying in the background. And he gives a talk to the camera where he lists the verses in the Quran that told him to do this. By the way, I think that, that guy was a convert, a black uh, Caribbean uh, resident of England who had converted to Islam. So which he wasn't Pakistani or Bangladeshi. It's not a race thing. It's not a place of birth thing. It's an ideology thing because the ideology is in the book. The book goes into the brain. Sometimes in brains, that ideology expresses itself as terrorism, as cutting people's heads off with machetes on the streets of London. Tommy Robinson invited Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer to the UK to talk at an event commemorating Lee Rigby. And this Home Secretary, Theresa May, now the Prime Minister, Theresa May banned these two peaceful people from coming to the country because she didn't want people to hear. And one of the aspects of dimitude is dimmies are not supposed to learn about the details of Islam because it's not for them. If they want to convert, they say something called the Shahada. And even the Shahada, there's a story to the Shahada. Last, last bit and then I'm closing this. The Shahada is this expression that to, they force new people to say once you've said it you're a Muslim so I'm probably shouldn't say it but they say they force you to say um, Allah Allah is God 
uh, and I recognize that Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet. Kind of like that, paraphrasing. But that's actually part of something that comes from a, uh, <laughs> comes from something called Muhammad's Farewell Address, which is not well documented in sites that you're going to find. But I've checked it with scholars and it, it's very, very real and it's quoted by real Muslims. And it says, I have been ordered to fight all men until they say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad, da -di da I have been, the bit that's cut off, the bit you don't hear often is, I have been ordered to fight and I fight all men until they say. Muhammad's farewell address. That's his last word. That's, that's the bit that was left. So... In short, Tommy Robinson was arrested, tried, convicted, sent to a dangerous, sent to prison, could be dangerous. I hope he's been kept safe. I hope that the outcry is keeping him safer. And I hope that the UK authorities, Theresa May and the uh, judges and the whole legal justice system realise that it will, um, it will it will come to pass that the British people understand the scale of what's been going on for 40 years. And anybody who was in authority during that period, some tough questions will be asked of you. Okay, enough for now. Thanks for watching. I'm Brian of London, here in Tel Aviv. Not in a beautiful place today, but free Tommy. <laughs>